Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So uh, we're delighted to have Sina join us today. He's here mainly to hike, but he agreed to give a talk as well. Uh, he's finishing, he's entering his fourth year at Princeton. Uh, his PhD advisor is Rob Shapiro, formerly Rob Caldwell. I mean, not that Rob Caldwell changed his name to Rob Shapiro. The advisor switched. Uh, I'm delighted to have him here. Thanks. Thank you very much, Chris. Thanks, everyone, for coming, and I'm really happy to see you again. Today, I'm going to talk about basically my this year internship project, which was in AT&T. And it was basically using a sparsity in two different projects. And let's see what we can do with them. So it's about the sparsity in question answering and in face classification. This is a joint work with Srinivas Bangalore and Patrick Hafner, Howard Karloff, Tanya Mishra, and Carlos Schreidiger. So they actually helped me a lot in this project. And this is something that before starting I should say, this is an ongoing, these are ongoing projects. So please feel free to stop me and ask questions at any time and also make comments at any time during the talk. So let's start. You know, we all know in machine learning that in many applications, actually in almost all applications, the data that we have is actually a high dimensional data. It lies in a high dimensional vector space, but it is a sparse. So we know the bag of word model in, in IR or the wave of decomposition in imaging. And in many cases, this data is actually, this sparsity level is hidden. So we would like to learn the sparsity level and then use that, use that as a feature space in order to be able to do better learning and, let's say, classification. You know, this actually helps us are removing the overfitting problems and also generalize better. So this is something that I'm going to talk also in this talk. I'll talk about, you know, extracting and exploiting the hidden sparsity level, the recovery of that, in, semi, in unsupervised and semi-supervised learning. Uh, cases. So we'll have real data sets in the two projects, face classification and question answering, and we'll see what are the barriers, what we can do, and what are the barriers in the current stages of the work. So let's just start with the face classification project. In the face classification, we have a bunch of you know, movies. So let's say that we actually we are Netflix users, we can get a lot of movies and we have them. And also, let's assume that we have the uh, access to internet. So we have the IMDb cast list. So let's say that, for instance, for the sleepless in Seattle, we'll have the cast list. We don't have any picture or anything related to cast list. Just we know who is the actually uh, who is acting in this movie. The goal of the project is then, suppose we have that for several movies. Now I give you a new movie, a sleepless in Seattle. Try to classify the faces of the actors, at least you know the famous actors in this project. And let's see what we can do. Um, so you know, the first thing is we need, some, we need some training data. Ideally, we need some label training data. So what we did is basically a way to get a, some sort of a noisy but OK training data set. We have a bunch of movies here that you can see. We use, a, basically, let's say, a, we implement a fast uh, standard face detection algorithm like, like Viola and Johnson. Then we do some standard face alignment methods so that we make sure that all of the faces are aligned. And as a result, we have a bunch of faces detected from different movies. Then we look at two movies that have just one actor in common. Let's say Up in the Air and Bernard Ferriting. They have George Clooney. And then we look at the pairs of faces in all these you know, pairs of movies that have the most similarity, something like this. You know, for instance, these two faces, we see that they are very similar to each other, let's say with the inner product similarity or Euclidean distance similarity. Then we conclude that as a result, with high probability, these two guys should be the same actor. And because those movies have only one actor in common, these two, we actually say that these two should be George Clooney. So this is a noisy way that by that, we can actually collect tr uh, label training examples. Now, after that, we, we need to now classify. So the, the next step is basically face classification. We actually we look at a lazy training, actually, paradigm. 
So let's assume that, you know, first let's assume for each face we convert it to a vector. So these are the all vectors, these are all faces of George Clooney, Peter Sellers, Ingrid Bergman, Bruce Lee. And for instance, therefore, um, this, this part of the matrix has a lot of faces of Bruce Lee that we actually have captured, each vector is there. Then we actually, somebody gives us a new face that, and wants us to classify it based on the faces that are here. What we can do is basically, we can actually exploit the known fact that if there, this is the face of the Bruce Lee, the, the known fact in face, in face classification and face analysis, that she tells us that every, you know, every face of Bruce Lee is, with, uh, is basically can be represented as a sparse linear combination of the faces that we have here, plus some noise, of course. So we would like to basically, in, in a way, exploit this sparsity and to classify this, this guy based on that. So let's be a little, sure. Uh, uh, linear combination of the pixels? Linear combination of the pixels, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. the driver's license people have a, another representation where they look at the distance between the eyes mm -hmm. and other features, this mm -hmm. for them, eyes to the mouth and so on so forth. Right, right, right. Why not use that as a feature set? The, we can actually do that too. I'll talk about that in some uh, in some sense. The thing is that um, so here so here the, the point is that you know the, the these angles and you know the ways that we these faces have are much more different. In that case, basically we have you know very uh, very restrictive so you controlled yeah exactly set of you know a feature space here is different. So this is actually this. Uh, just a bit, you know, assuming the linear sparsity is basically a more robust uh, assumption in that case. But I'll actually very shortly talk about that too. Yep. And so, so let's actually formalize the problem then a little bit. We have a vector then in R m, let's say m dimensional. Let's assume that we actually convert it to a vector, so it is a square root m by a square root m. And then we have a matrix. The matrix has the number of actors times the number of you know, faces per actor columns, and each actor has m rows because we converted that to a uh, matrix, to a vector, I'm sorry. Then our goal is to find a linear combination of these columns here such that well approximates this, uh, this vector f. So this brings us actually to the classical problem of sparse approximation and sparse recovery. In sparse recovery, if I want to say, which is actually the problem, the, the problem of compressed sensing and also a lot of graphical modeling and other related stuff too, we have a vector, let's say x star, which is the sparse. So it has only a very few, uh, relatively few number of non-zero entries. And also we have a matrix A, which actually, let's now assume that it's a general matrix. I'll talk about its properties uh, it's that we actually will exploit, but let's say that this is this. And also we have noise. So we are given a vector f, and somebody tells us that it is a, the matrix that we have, times a sparse vector x plus noise. And our goal is to recover or approximate x star from the measurement vector f. Um, so of course, let's for the beginning even forget the noise. What we want is to solve this optimization problem. Minimize, so L0 says the number of non-zero entries. So it says we would like to have the sparse vector x such that ax equals f, you know, if we forget e. But unfortunately, this problem is MP hard. So during the last couple, actually, uh, I should say even 15 years or even more, people started to think about ways to, re to approximate or relax the problem. The basis pursuit algorithm, which is actually if formally introduced by Chen and Donahoe, but was known even before that, says that let's, be, uh, let's forget, now that we cannot solve the L0 minimization, let's look at L1 minimization. L1 is basically the close, uh, the, is a convex norm, so this is a convex optimization program, but it also has very, cl it's the closest norm to the L0 norm that we can have. So this is the proposed basis pursuit algorithm. And of course, because we have noise, we have to uh, consider noise too. So the lasso, which was actually introduced by Tipshirani and also is used very widely, says that we can use the L1 minimization, but 
uh, with this constraint. So we say that we are OK. We, of course, we don't have exactly this uh, linear equality, but the residual, we want that to be small, be smaller than the residual of the norms or a constant times that. But in this case, actually, for this problem, it seems that another pro a linear programming is actually a might be a better solution. So here, the assumption is that the noise vector is also sparse. So if we go, uh, we'll actually go and see it in the phase, uh, phase classification. But it assumes that, OK, now that if we assume that the noise vector is also sparse, we can actually integrate them together. So the optimization becomes minimize the L1 norm of x. So that, you know, so x now becomes x and e together. We actually concatenate them together. And we, therefore, we, actually, we also concatenate the identity matrix with A. And we would like that to be f, the vector f that we have. So this is the basis for pseudo denoising and is recently proposed by Wright and Ma for uh, these kind of problems where we can have some uh, sparsity assumption for the noise too. And there are some theoretical results about that, but I'm not going to talk about it. Iceland identity. Iceland identity, exactly. So if you look, yeah, because we concatenate noise here too. So it's actually, yeah. So uh, basically, uh, the, the, the first thing that I should say is that we tried both of them. This one worked better. And the second thing is um, um, the, basically the fact that you know, if, if you have uh, the local integrity that you'll have together. <coughs> so the pixels that are close to each other will be actually very, we uh, like them to be close to each other. Let's, let's assume that, for instance, the eyes or the noses or, and these things. Um, so this kind of, so therefore the, their differences usually do not matter so much. So this basically maps to uh, the sparsity of the noise, but but that's uh, basically a, still that your, your comment works. We actually we should see if this one works better or this one. Uh, mostly empirically, this one, this assumption that noise is sparse, works better in this case. And uh, and something uh, you may also uh, I should refer you to this paper to right and mod. They also have some sections. Basically, explaining those that locality that I, m I mentioned in detail. So noise is sparse if you have images in your database that are close enough to mm -hmm. test. To test, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So this is then the just the justification that I also wanted to have about why we are actually using L1 minimization. When we say L1 minimization, it says because you might actually say why not L2 minimization? We can actually have an explicit solution for L2 minimization. So let's look what, hap what is happening here. So this is the line AX equals F that we have. And this is the, uh, so this is then the, let's say, identity L1 diamond that we have. So uh, you know, the points that have L X, the L1 norm of X equals one. And we actually, we try to grow this diamond until it hits this line. And the same here, so let's see what happens. So here, this is, you know, this is the solution of the L2 minimization. This is the solution of L1 minimization. You see here, it actually hits close to an access point. So the solution here is relatively sparse. Although I'm just using you know, this for illustration, but uh, to actually give you just the idea. But here, the intersection point is this one. And this is not a sparse. Both, you know, it has x value and y value. So it gives just an, you know, some sort of an intuition why we shall use L1 minimization. So then this is the phase classification algorithm, right? Um, it's, uh, it's actually, uh, if I want to say what it does, we first normalize the columns. That's just an assumption uh, that we make to make sure that we are not actually changing the energy too much. Then we use the basis pursuit at the noising algorithm to get an sparse, basically to find the an sparse set of columns representing F. Then we need two things. We need to look at two things. One of them is that you know, if you, if you give me a phase, how should I know that it is basically, it is a linear combination of these guys? So for instance, if you give me a phase, how should I know that it's Bruce Lee, for instance? For this, we look at this residual. This residual says that, says how much this uh, recovered vector is a sparse, actually. So if it is close to one, R is the number of factors that we have. If it is close to one, then it says that the vector is actually concentrated on just one of these actors. So we have actor one up to actor r. 
if it is close to zero, then it says that the vector is very dense. So it has elements in all, in all of them. So we say that if the value that we get is less than some threshold that we said a priori, we reject. We said that this is none of the factors. But if it is actually higher than that, then again, you can either you know, just look at this value, S, for different actor sets, or you can simply look at the residual. So this is what we did. We looked at the residual F minus, let's say, A concentrated to these actors times the corresponding coefficient. The second one, the third one, and the one that has you know, the minimum residual value, we choose that. So this is the procedure that we have. And I should mention, because I'm going to show you some actually uh, comparisons, that the previous state of the art and the, the basically the thing that people usually use for phase classification is SVM. And SVM with some distance learning, which is actually uh, the work of Weinberger et al. And it's basically, so it's again based on the similarity of the phases, the, the, the thing that we mentioned that a new phase, if it is a phase of Bruce Lee, it will be very similar to the training set the training set phases that we have. So we use linear kernel is usually fine. But we can actually also try to learn a distance matrix. So we can actually try to learn an affine transform. In that, we'll have a better representation of the vectors. L is global? L is global, yes. 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 And so the, so the, the Weinberg Killian actually proposes an, SB, as an STP semi-different programming for learning this uh, re relevant to the optimization of the support vector machines. But you know, even though they provide a specific algorithm for solving that, it is usually slow. So the drawback of this is comparing to SVM is that learning this is usually takes a long time. But this is global, so we can actually do that once. And the good thing is that, as we'll see, it does something better. Oh, yes, sure. Can I ask us a question two slides back? Yes, sure. Uh -huh. You're not redetermining the best vector for just the AI. You're using the vector you had determined once. Mm -hmm. So it seems like if you have if you have sort of a lot of cor correlations between these different actors, like if there's two actors in front of a green background, there's uh -huh. kind of random luck whether it picks up the green from one the, or, or another. Uh, so so we remove the background and everything like that. So what we have is basically a just the face. Just the face. Just the face, and also we remove the contrasts and everything related to that. Yeah. White to the uh, In this experiment, it was black and white. Yeah. And you rescaled? Like and we rescaled, yeah, and did the rotation alignment to make sure. And so because all of these actually introduced noise, but actually also helps, you know, the, the next parts of Just that. Think about using other bases to write pixels seem like. Uh, I tried Wavelet. The results in Wavelet were not so good. So I still don't know exactly why, but. Uh, relative, you know, comparing to the pixel domain, the wavelet domain was not so good. There's also a work about doing, I think they do it for, for classification, but for, for other mm -hmm. uh, image classification, they use kind of patches, try to build mm -hmm. image out of patches mm -hmm. of images from, you know, from the same domain. Mm -hmm. it sounds kind of for mm -hmm. examples. Right. That's, that's a good point, too. The, the, thing is that the, the thing that I have to ask you, actually, is we want this ultimately for in, an, you know, in an online setting. So we want to have these classifications in an online case. If we have patches, can we do them also efficiently online? I think if we can, then that's actually that's worth trying that. And I'll be very happy even to talk to you about that at some point after it. I'm not familiar with the state of the audience. So. Yeah, so these, these were just the very initial experiments that we did. We used uh, four actors and 80 faces for each, uh, for each of them. And then we used a cross-validation, and we looked at the cross-validation errors of you know, the actors. And so this is the basis pursuit, the L1 minimization that we use, the basis pursuit denoising. This is that with distance learning. So we actually we mapped the data from pixel domain to that learned distance domain too. This is SVM, and this is distance learning SVM. So, uh, the, the, so as we can see, you know, the results here in, in these experiments were actually relatively promising. Uh, but my, uh, one reason of that, I should actually say right now, was because we had noise. So the data set that we had was noisy. And that was a problem that SVM 
actually it was facing. Uh, when we tried other you know, state-of-the-art phase classification data sets, the results were much closer. But here, because of the noise, this algorithm turned out to be more robust to noise that we have. Then again, we actually tried in the next uh, experiment a larger set of actors. Here we can see the results. Some things that I have to mention is, for instance, this one, this actor set that had very large you know, classification error. We looked at that, the data, the training set for that was very noisy. So this is something that, uh, this is something that I'll mention, actually I'll talk about that later, the, the issue of the noise in, the, in obtaining the training data sets. But relatively, uh, the thing that, uh, the message of these two slides were that this algorithm, even though much uh, slower than SVM, it was more consistent and more robust. So, then the next thing, we actually focused on Sleepless in Seattle, the movie. Actually, I'm just saying this movie as a special case. In this movie, we actually, so this is the frames of the movie, let's say, we, that we captured, about 7,000. And these are the confidences of the face classification algorithm. And this is a sorted version of this, so this is just a PDE for this. And uh, for instance, you can see that if we, if we take the value 0.6, then we'll actually have uh, some value here. Confidence of identifying one actor or? Uh, uh, just saying that if the, this frame is either one of those actors or it's another one. Yeah. So not, not, I'm, I'm talking about the classification accuracy in the next slide. So yeah, as we mentioned, then we took one confidence value and we looked at um, the classification ac accuracy. For this particular one, I looked at uh, that manually. So there, even in these numbers, there might be some error because of my eye, um, because you know we didn't have labels. But just as we can, I, I wanted to show you the examples that some examples, some random faces that I too can uh, look at the results. So here, for instance, this is Tom Hanks and this is Mike Ryan, and these two are misclassified here. Also, I think this one. And the next thing is actually going back to that that question is making this algorithm faster. So we, we actually we have some uh, suggestions for making it faster. One of them is running SVM first. If the SVM support vector machines has some high confidence, then we are OK. We say that the SVM is doing a good job. Otherwise, we run our algorithm. So this makes the overall uh, uh, learning time much actually faster. The other thing is that we don't need to solve the optimization exactly. This is one suggestion. We can just solve it up to some, uh, some number of iterations, not up to very close accuracy value. And the other thing is that we can actually exploit the temporal coherences. So for instance, if frame one and frame three are McRyan, then with high probability, the frame in the middle is also her. So as to, because in video, we have you know, these temporal coherences. So we can actually use that in the classification. So if we're doing that, the classification accuracy a little bit dropped, but not so much. So in our current you know, uh, version of the classifier, we're, we incorporate these three ways. And we are, we are, we'll be very happy to have any other suggestions for them. So if there is no question, I'll go to the second part of the talk. So why did you choose a male and a female this? Here in this experiment, yeah, because it was much more distinctive. I did experiments with Ocean 11 also and the Mexican. And in those we have, actually currently I've used uh, up to six actors, different, because in Ocean 11 it was George Clooney and so they were different people. And in them, all, again, we had some sort of consistency, um, but of course a little bit less than this. So this was just one example I wanted to show here, especially because it's in Seattle. <laughs> so now what the question answering. I think in the question answering, um, we all know about that. We actually we are interested in a automatically answering questions. We have data sets, and we would like to do that using machine learning and information retrieval methods uh, the best that we can. So this is actually a problem that is uh, work here. I'm very happy Chris told me that there are going to be much more research also here in question answering. So we have IBM Watson, we have Ask MSR here, and also a, a recent application in at and which is QMI. So QMI is introduced by Srinivas Bangalore and Tanya Mishra. It uses a very large corpus of question answer pairs, which are provided to them. And this, question, this corpus is 
basically questions here are answered by human experts and they also categorize them. They split the question, uh, any new question that comes into two categories. The static is a question that doesn't change so much by time and they, re they try to retrieve the answer from the corpus. Dynamic is a question that changes very rapidly. For that one, they outsource the question, so they use the web information to do that. Now, for, to answer the, que the static question answer questions, they basically what they do is they use blue score or T and gram TFIDF. So they find the best match in the question answer pair and output the corresponding answer. So this works very well if, if the question is in the corpus. So if, so if we have a very close you know, question in the corpus, we, with this method we can find it because blue score is basically relatively robust. So we have high precision but low recall, especially in the, you know, when we tried to use ex random samples from this question answer set, we observed that there is some low recall. So our goal here in this part of the talk is basically to find the set of relevant questions and hope that we have a, a higher recall. So I'll postpone to you know, ranking them and getting a larger F measure to some other time. I'll just talk about recall. And so for to actually to increase the recall, our approach was to use, you know, to expand the questions. So we try to find a set of relevant words from the question from the corpus of the question answer pair that we have. For instance, you know, for the question who is the president of China, of course, this is a very simple question. We might actually be able to actually expand that based on similarities that we'll get. For instance, for president, something like leader, and China with republic, something like that, and get. So we, and to do this, we tried four different expansion methods. LDA, two of them were basically generative methods, LDA and linked LDA. Two others are uh, discriminative, SVD and linked SVD. There are basically, their approaches are, um, all try to you know, use topics basically. They, uh, but two of them are, these two are generative and these two are discriminative. So it's good to look what they did on our data set. Bunch of questions with their answers. So yeah, yeah. You want to map your questions to something that's exactly. Questions. Yeah, yeah. And how many questions were there? Uh, so there were uh, the ones that I used were I used a subset of them. So five million I used, five million I used, but there were much more actually. So then this is the so this is the roadmap that we have. So this is as Chris mentioned. This is the question answer data set that we have. We generate a core occurrence matrix. So. Let's say I actually I have to go I'll go to the detail of that in next slide, but let's just say this actually the rows are the words of the vocabulary and the columns are question answer prayers. So this is just for the simple simplest approach that we can have. And then we map them to some uh, so this is a very sparse vector, every row of this matrix. We map them to some low dimensional topic matrix. So here again we have words, but here these are topics. And then we look at the we trade them as you know, vectors in this low dimensional space and then we look at the vector similarity between them to find the closest um, word to word, let's say football, which is here in this case. Just. And we, so before starting, we need to do some pre-processing. For pre-processing, we did the following. So first, using NLTK, we removed the subwords and also we did some sort of stemming here, not very detailed stemming, but just to, you know, uh, remove some of them. This, the third one was the spell checking. For spell checking, we, you know, we didn't have a very you know, an open source spell checker and uh, that we can actually use that in batch mode. So the approach that we used was, we say that every word that we have, if wordnet, oh, I'm sorry, this is wordnet. I'm sorry, this is not, yeah. If wordnet accepts that, then we are fine. If the wordnet rejects that, and this happened actually because when I looked, for instance, for Obama, wordnet was not updated, so it didn't have that. So we we'll also look at the whole uh, corpus. If the co whole corpus has this word in several times, we again accept it, otherwise we reject it. And with this, we could actually reduce the size of the vocabulary set significantly. So um, it was very much. After doing this pre-processing, we now need to map the data to some lower dimensional space. So again, you know, if, uh, just reminding you about topics, we know that, you know, each, the people talk about very few topics, so our goal is to learn this word topic matrix that we have and then use the similarity, either cosine similarity or Helen general distance. I'll talk actually, so for some cases, this was a better measure, this one was in other cases a better measure. How do you choose number of topics? 
the number of I actually chose them ad hoc, so that was the that was one of the very few parts of the project that I just you know chose at the trial and error for that. And then, so the first method that we used was LDA. I'm just going to give a very uh, short overview of that. LDA is basically a generative approach. So we assume that the document is a bag of words, and uh, so as, the, as a result, every word of this document is generated in an IID process. Each topic is in a sparse, hopefully a sparse distribution over the dictionary that we have. And each document is in a sparse distribution over the topics. So for instance, here if we look, so this is the document that we have. For instance, you know, the topic is sports, let's say. It's in a sparse distribution over the dictionary. So words like football, basketball, rugby, these, these words have you know, high probability of being selected. The other words have less. And then, this, look at, for instance, if you look at this uh, document, there are very, you know, for instance, the topic, let's say, um, the topic uh, biology that has you know, something like life and these things. Uh, this document is in a sparse uh, distribution over all topics. The topic is sports, biology, and the other one. So it is choosing the topics biology, genetics, and computation. And then the last thing to come, the last thing is the generation of the words. So we have these topics generated. We have these documents as sparse distributions over the topics. Then the process of generating a word is the following. We choose a topic, basically. We sample a topic. We sample a topic from this document for each word. And then we sample a, a vocabulary word from the corresponding topic. And then that's the word that we have. And of course, we just see the values, the, the words. So these words are the only observed things that we see. So what we do is that we use the posterior inference to learn the best possible topic distributions and document distributions that matches the, um, our model. So this is the, just a very quick uh, overview of LDA. And then we use the posterior probabilities to generate the word topic matrix. There is another thing that we have to actually exploit in some sense, the uh, structure of the question answering set. So of course, you know, this is the previous thing that I mentioned, the question words and the answer words were uh, both are, were treated in the same way. So we didn't have any distinction in between them. But here, what we like is actually to you know, have the most similar question words to the questions that we have. So for this, we changed that and we actually looked at the linked LDA. Uh, this linked LDA is basically a model that is used for, to model, you know, let's say, for instance, the, artic the NIPS articles and corresponding authors, or the blogs and corresponding comments. So we use that also here. So it says that, again, as before, each document is in a sparse distribution over topics. So let's say when we sample, we sample topic two. But topic two is a pair now. Topic two is a pair, is in a sparse distribution over the question words, plus another sparse distribution over answer words. So the question word and answer words are coming from two different vocabulary sets, and the, top, the corresponding topics have different. So why not just ignore the answers and model the questions and map your incoming query to the questions? Uh, I'll go to that. The, the point was that, that, again, the recall. So that's the issue that we have with recall. When we do that, the chance that we get, you know, we don't get any answer for them increases to some sense. But in the final cases, in the final slides, I have some you know, analysis comparing these two. That's a, that's a good question, actually. The two others are you know, the SVD. SVD is basically a discriminative approach. And it's actually taking it much simpler. So it says this is the co-occurrence matrix that we have. We said that you know, we are talking about a very few topics. So Hopefully, we must be able to approximate it by a very low rank matrix, by a matrix that can be uh, decomposed as a, as a multiplication of these two matrices, where here, this is the number of topics. So this is the vocabulary topic matrix, and this is the topic document matrix. So, and this is just saying that we want to have the best, let's say, the number of topics rank approximation of this matrix. And we, can, we know that we can solve it using singular value decomposition. So this is basically the generalization of the sparsity that we had in the question answer pairs to matrices, from sparsity and L0 to L0 in matrices, which is rank here. And of course, again, we like to make a distinction begin between question words and answer words. So we can actually generate a question answer co-occurrence matrix too. This matrix here 
these are the question vocabulary words, these are answer words. And the numbers here says the number of times this word and this word co-occur in the corpus that we have. Again, we can actually you know, use a low rank approximation of that and use that. So we use these, this matrix basically as our um, similarity matrix. So this is the vocabulary, this is the topics. And here, this is a question vocabulary and then something like that as topics. So I'm just showing you some examples of the things that we re recovered and then going to some quantitative experiments to them. So these are some of the topics that, I, that are you know, retrieved for each of them. And this is just for an illustration. They are not very much informative. And most of the other topics, I should say, do, <coughs> do not actually match to something that we can interpret very well. But if we go to you know, something like the most similar words, for instance, this is the word wine that we have here, we see that you know, this, the, this, the observation is that this LSA and QLSA is uh, the linked LSA basically here, uh, provide something, some words that are more, you know, we can actually replace this wine with them or very much related. This is LDA and I'll show more results in the next slides also is the words that are actually sometimes actually they co-occur with the word wine that we have here. So uh, basically just as an uh, uh, point from the, um, as, we can see, uh, as we can see, this LSA and QLSA might be a more appropriate cases for our, uh, for our experiments. But we, um, we should look more at them, at the results here. So these are the, again the results for more uh, for other uh, words that I tried. For many of them, there, there is also, there were not so much different. For instance, for King, as we'll see, for some of them, but for most of them, uh, for the case of question answering, SVD or LSA was more appropriate. And um, so these are just some illustrations that we have here. For, for instance, the, I, Figure, uh, you know, from my point of view, the LDA itself had, you know, the least performance, and the uh, SVD or LSA had the best. But those were uh, just, I'm sorry, this one too. <coughs> these are results, uh, and in many cases, these they were very similar. The results were very similar, and so the final. I'm not surprised that the LDA didn't do as well as the SVD. This was actually, you know, the reverse surprise, I should say, because at the very beginning of the project, the main goal was to use LDA. Right. And we did this, and I actually talked with David Bly to make sure that we are doing everything in a correct way. And so, but finally, yeah, the this, this thing was that SVD was. So presumably, the, I don't know this, but presumably the LDA community has compared to SVD with their own stuff and find it to be better. Um, this is. Uh, the, the point is that actually, yeah, the, the point is that in, in those communities, most of the you know, comparisons are just you know, from the eye point of view. So they don't have very quantitative measures to compare them. And this is something that when, when David also gives a talk, people usually ask. And for that, he has you know, invented a, a, something like a supervised LDA and something like that to do them. But for, for something like these tasks, they still don't have very, as far as I know, and as far as I talked with him, actually. There is not so much, you know, as a good way of measuring the consistency and the accuracy of this. Yes, ma'am. So if I'm not mistaken, isn't LDA determines how many clusters you should do automatically? Is that right, or you still had to determine? No, no, no. Uh, so that's that's. This is a good question. In that case, we have a non-parametric LDA, or, and the, this, the thing that we used here was a, uh, actually was not a non-parametric. So it was parametric again with the same values, the same things. If you do that. That tries to learn also the number of topics from, uh, from right. they put, it puts another distribution. But it doesn't change the results so much, so much if you choose the number of topics. Still. So the number of topics that I chose here was about 1,200 in this experiment. And with, you know, more, with less than that, the results were actually not good at all. With more than that, there were not so much difference. With much less and much more, I mean. I guess one advantage of LDA you could say is that you wouldn't have to Figure out. That's itself. that's that's right. That's right. But as long as you have some validation data or something, maybe that's not that. Much yeah. Advantage. Yeah. That, that's right. You're absolutely right. And the last thing, so basically, coming back to Chris's question, was actually we wanted to have a quantitative evaluation. Previously, 
Tanya and Srinivas, they were actually, they distributed a set of questions and asked people to manually label them and give the relevant ones. The problem was that the questions there was not exactly from the same space as the questions in this data set. So they were very simple questions that people usually asked and came into their mind. So, so whereas here in the question and saying the questions are more, have much more diversity. So the, this is the thing that we came up with and I'll be very, very happy if you also have any suggestion about that. So we split the data set into training questions and test questions. So this is a training question and training answers corresponding to them. And let's assume this is a test question, and the, corresponding to that, there is a test answer that we only use for evaluation. For this test answer, we look at the set of answers that are similar to that using a blue score. So not very sharp similarity like the things that Tanya and Srinivas were doing for exactly recovering. We actually let some, you know, we use some shorter thresholds. We find some similar answers here. And then we look at the similar questions corresponding to them. There, so there is a one-to-one -one mapping from this to this, let's say. And then we do the expansion, and we use Lucene, basically a TF-IDF, to, to do a retrieval here. And then we look at you know, the set of, the overlap of this set over the whole ratio of these good questions, these similar questions that are here. And so these were the things that we got. So these are the relative improvements. Again, we were actually, you know, we got better results for S SVD. And the other thing, the, so the thing that I have to emphasize was here also, WordNet. I'm sorry again, this is WordNet. So with WordNet, we even had, you know, much, so much negative improvement here. So this says that the, the feature space that WordNet has, the similarities that WordNet provide, is not a very appropriate similarity measure for our case, for question answering. So their spaces are different. So this is something that uh, we actually had, and with, the other, with these guys, we had improvements, but so these are relative improvements. Sure. What, what are you evaluating? I mean, so I'm doing, so I splitted this set into question sets, test sets, right? right? So uh, I'm sorry, the training set, test set. Then for each test question, I look at this mm -hmm. test answer. I just, I, I just want to know what. I mean, you could measure a question answering and evaluate it by just seeing how many answers you get right. So, so that, that's the hard thing. So how, how do you define the right, basically, here? Uh, I would, so did you, I guess you, uh, you use the studies right in the question. Uh, so so, we, uh, so that, that was the thing that was done. The point was that you know, if, we, if we have, uh, if we want to have, so, so this set is relatively large. We, if we wanted to have, we, have, we had to distribute these question answer pairs a large, relatively large set to people, and currently at that time they were not. So this is something that we will definitely do. We will definitely do, but at, the, at that time in the internship, so we didn't have so much material to do that. So, th so this is an automated version of that exactly. Yep. And the same thing basically. Uh, so Tanya, when we did had that this comment that we need to look at basically question set as well, just question set and see what we do there, as Chris also mentioned here. And so we did the same thing here. So here, the similar questions are questions that are basically, that our blue score without expansion says th those are relevant questions. And then we do expansion and we do the TFIDF similarity also. We find a set of retrieved questions and then we look at the overlap over the set of similar questions. And again, we got, so here the results are then more stable, much more stable in this question set, which says that you know, this blue score with shorter threshold is consistent with, with these question expansion methods. And again, we got negative improvement with WordNet. So this was the thing that we also tried this question with uh, just expand, uh, with just looking at questions without answers and relatively, we got the same set of results. But again, I totally, you know, I should say this was just an, an experiment that we had at that time because of the time limit. In order to evaluate these guys more, we need to actually have some human labeled uh, evaluation. Have you about using something like Mechanical Turk? It sounds like a possible. That was something that we actually we thought about that at that time too. That came up to the end of my internship at that period. So. We didn't. We haven't done that yet. But I guess that's something. I guess finally we'll do that in that way. So we talked about that. That's it. That's it. That's it. Actually, yeah. Very good. Very good. So just to wrap up, I'm sorry, I took a long time. 
Uh, so we looked at two, basically two projects, one of them question answering, one of them phase classification, and the way that we can use a sparsity to do classifications there. We have several challenges remained, as during the talk all of you mentioned. In phase classification, one of the main issues is denoising the training set. So the training set, we looked at the similarity between uh, you know, faces from different movies that share the, uh, only one actor in their cast list. The thing is that can we do uh, this, you know, we know that the classifier is doing relatively well, not very well, but when the classifier classifies something, can we actually replace bad training examples with the ones that we get from these classifiers from newer movies to clean, make this classifier cleaner? So this is something that we need to do and we need to see how it works, but we should be aware of overfitting here. And of course, we need, you know, in, because in, if we want to have it in a, as a final result, we need to do more experiments with larger actor sets. So the largest set that I've used currently is six actors, but of course, we need to go beyond. In question answering, better, or actually, experiments are required, so this is something that we will definitely do. And uh, so and this, the other thing that might be uh, that is interesting, actually, is to try to do the ranking after this information retrieval, after this and see how much we can actually increase the F measure, which is the final goal of the task. And I'll be ha very happy if you have any other suggestion and any comments about that. And thank you very much. Thanks for saying to the talk. Thank you. Thank you. Are you around for a little bit longer than 10 minutes? Yes, 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 sure. So I think we can stick around for a bit if you want to chat. Sure. No more questions, all right. Thanks. See you again. Thank you very much, everyone.